My name is Mark Demansky. Uh, we're going to talk about WebGIA. Um, the problem, you know, everybody's got, everybody needs permissions to do their job. Uh, that's your help desk needs to be able to reset passwords. Uh, security needs to disable accounts or, or update policies, things like that. Um, and what are your options? You, you can grant them those permissions, but if you're using something like Azure, uh, you end up with granting them too many permissions. There's not a, a perfect role for them, or you can't go in, you know, you don't have the time perhaps to, in AD to, to scope exactly what users they should be able to reset their password for, or something like that. And so the, you end up with a, a security exposure. Uh, your alternative is you you don't give them those permissions, and you end up they they end up coming to you to do to do their job. Um, neither of those are are perfect for their own reasons. Um, you know who who's who's ever dealt with uh, that call at ten o'clock on Friday night, and the boss says, "Hey, I need you to disable this account right now." And so you, you pull up your phone and you're, you know, you're at the movies and you, you RDP in and, and you try and do your job. Uh, you know, you're working on a screen this big. Uh, or, or, you know, you, you're, you've taught your, your staff how to do PowerShell enough that, that you're sharing scripts on a network share and, and you're doing it right. You've got, you've got a network share, it's read only for them. But you know people are taking copies and they're, they want to look at it, right? And they, they move it to their own drive and they're running it there. And now you update the share, but he's using the old, you know, one guy's using that old script and it, it doesn't do what you want it or doesn't validate something properly. We can address all of these with WebGIA. Um, in a nutshell, WebGIA is a .NET web application that you host on your server and runs with one credential that you have to manage. So that, that credential is your app pool identity and you can grant it whatever permissions you need, if that's account operators, if that's access in O365, this is the only account you have to, to manage permissions on. You grant people access to WebGIA through groups, by user account, whether that's local or domain. Uh, it'll, it'll take all of them. And the, the result is now you give a, a consistent experience to every user who, who, who needs to perform the same task and, and they're doing it securely and you haven't had to grant them any more permissions than exactly what, what's needed. So we're gonna jump into the demo. Um, let's pretend uh, you're, you're, uh, you're overworked, you're, uh, <laughs> you, you're understaffed, right, right? And we're just going to pretend, let's say, that your, uh, your help desk can't reset passwords consistently. Um, you know, what's your typical reset password? They, somebody calls up, they say, hey, it's Joe in marketing. Maybe your help desk gets them to validate a credential or, you know, validate their employee ID or something. There's a couple more seats left if you want to. Um, you know, maybe you get them to validate uh, employee ID or birth date or whatever it might be, and they go and reset the password, and what do they do? Oh, it's capital password one, two, three, or something equally inconsistent, and maybe half the time they forget, check the user must change password. I mean, th that's, it's a common issue. Um, so what, we're going to step into 
Uh, I'm not going to walk you through deployment, but I will walk you through the configuration a little bit. Uh, basically, I built a DSC config that should handle most people's needs. Um, let's see, get you back up to the top here. From a from a bare VM to with a with a certificate and a credential to work with, it takes five to ten minutes to deploy this. There, there's not a whole lot, there are not a whole lot of surprises in here, but I'm gonna highlight a couple of them just so you're aware. Uh, WebGeo was designed to use a managed service account. If you're not using a managed service account, use a managed service account. <laughs> but but it, will, it will work with traditional accounts, you know, just create an account in AD. Um, you'll have to make some changes to, to the DSC if you want to do that. But otherwise, it's, it's basically just a, a straight drop these files in a folder, create an app pool, and, and you're good to go. Um, the things to watch out for, you need to load the user profile. Uh, that's a little, it's maybe a little out of the ordinary, but that's necessary so that uh, if you need to import PowerShell sessions or use environmental variables or any of these things, they don't exist otherwise. And then here, uh, let me see if I can make this a little bit. There we go. There's, there's one script resource in here that, that handles uh, managed service count instead of the built-in resource. The built-in resource requires you to specify a username and password, and with a managed service account, you don't have the password. So, so there's a custom resource in here. Uh, other, everything else is copying files. The only thing we do at the very end, uh, so we, we change some, some variables. I'll show you the, confi the, the configuration in just a second. We set, there it is. We set logon as a service for whatever managed service account you're using. That's it, we, we put it in the app pool and it, it's gotta be able to do that to run. Configuration is, is pretty straightforward. You know, you define your, your app pool or your, uh, your app pool username and then the various folders that you're gonna be working with. Uh, WebGIA runs on one configuration file. Uh, it's JSON based. There is a module in, uh, in the gallery for managing that. Uh, we'll, you'll, get to see, you'll get to see that used here in just a little bit. And you drop in a certificate and, and that's all you have to do. So, we'll clear out, make sure we can connect. Okay. So this is running on a VM on the box. Um, it's core, we support, it supports both core and desktop, but only 16. Uh, there's no reason 12 shouldn't work but I didn't do any testing. I just didn't feel that there was any value there. It's, you know, use 16. Use 16 with 5.1 and, and get the best, the best feature set. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna set some of the default values uh, for, for the website, and then we'll, we'll add our first script and show you how quickly you can be up and running. If you've got, you know, we're gonna load the config, we're gonna import the, the module, we're gonna import the config, we're gonna set a default set of users who can access this. By default, it's the local administrators. So, so when, if, if, once you finish deployment, your local administrators on that machine can access the, the website. But for, for the demo here, we're gonna, we're gonna add this. 
And then we're going to set uh, log parameters true. And I'll show you logging at the end if we've got time. And we save the configuration. And it ran, which is better than I've heard some of them, some of the demos. I won't, you know, maybe not quite as funny as Jason previously, but I'll, I'll do my best. So, so the idea here is to show you how quickly you can be up and running with WebGS. So if, so if you figure my test, I was able to deploy this in under 15 minutes from an OS. So if you're using a template in VM, this should take you no time to deploy. And so, so we're going to take, go, going back to our password reset for the help desk, you know, we've got, you know, we want to do some validation. We want to make sure their, the, the username's found. We're going to check their employee ID. That, that's going to be, for, for our first, our, our fastest fix for them, this is what we're going to do. So we set up a param employee ID and username. We go through, we make sure that it's, that, that we find the username. If not, we'll, we'll error out. Make sure the employee ID is found. And then we generate a new password. We, you know, we, we set it into the account. And then we make sure that the user has to change password at logon. At the end, we print out the password. So this script should take you five, 10 minutes perhaps. Maybe, maybe if you're less experienced, maybe, maybe this will take you up to 30 minutes. If we come back in, oh, that stopped the right, there we go. What we're doing here is we're opening the config file. We're gonna add this new demo, this new script. We're gonna say anybody can get to this for the, for the demo. And that'll, that'll come back later when I show you which, uh, just confirm for you that, that the permissioning works. We're gonna make it the default. So anybody who logs in is gonna see this command when they log in. And we save the file. I think that ran. Yeah. Let's see if I can type my username and password. If it's first try or not. Oh. Hey, look at that. So we've generated the form just from param, parentheses, username, and, and employee ID. So I can put anything I want in here. And what this is doing now is running that script with those parameters. Just a couple seconds. It's always slow on that first one, you know. lot slower on this first one. It's always slower and the demo gods are not being friendly to me today. Yeah. Did you mention the uh, error handling? In the if I figure the employee ID or username, it tells you it's not found. Well in this case, yeah, if if we'll we'll come back to this and let it let it bake for just a second. So that's that's just whatever you want to handle in here. Uh, in this case, we're doing a try. We get the username. If it fails, we'll just spit out user not found and get out. Oh, come on. I did. It's, that's right. Uh-oh. 
try it again here. If it doesn't go in just a couple seconds, we'll have to go to the video. Let's try it one more time. Yeah, it, it, I've, I've seen that, but it should drop down right here at the bottom. I don't know what it's doing. All right, well, we'll go to the video. We'll go to the replay. Go back. All right. So that's what you would have seen. <laughs> uh, the, the advantage here, in, in addition to just making sure that the users, that, that your help desk employee in this case, um, has done some legitimate validation, we're also generating a, a password that is secure. Um, I think we can take this a little step, uh, a little bit further, and we'll get some nice benefit out of it. And maybe the website will catch up. Look at that. It did it for real. <laughs> um, you just gotta, you just gotta make it look, make everybody look bad, and then it'll go right. All right, so we can extend this a bit and take advantage of advanced functions. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, I've, got a, I've got a script on my GitHub that you can use. It uh, covers most of this. But you can add synopsis. You can add descriptions of your parameters, uh, you know, proper documentation that everyone's doing, right? Right, yeah. But we're gonna do some validation in here. We're gonna make sure that the usernames are in the correct format, or you know, if maybe you wanted to check email address instead. Put in a pattern for email address. You know, we've got help messages. They're mandatory now. You know, we, we, we're gonna say, this is a mandatory field. In our demo, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and add another validation. You've gotta provide birth date. And Perhaps you've got an environment where you have multiple accounts that you might need to reset passwords for. So we're gonna offer uh, a drop-down box where you can just select, 
it, well, in this case, it's a, it's a list box where you can just select which properties you want to, or which services you want to reset the password for. Um, you know, if you look here, we've got, you're taking a, a multi-valued string. We'll see that in just a second. You know, we, we start using the advanced functions, formatting, everything down here, not really relevant to the demo. It's whatever you want to put in the script. We're going to do basically the same thing. Uh, in this case, we're going to specify a group. No! I did jinx it. Did I add it? I did really. Oh, it threw an error. <laughs> no, it added it. And then it threw an error. I wonder if. Config file is not defined since I rebooted. Thank y'all. No, can't do that. No, nope, I don't need that. I need this. There we go. Hey, look at that, no errors. And now we get there. So what you can see is we've got the synopsis that you put in there. You've got all the help messages that you define, all the, both from the advanced, from, from the, the script block up at the top, the comment block, as well as if you define help messages, those are all presented. Uh, you know, we even tell you, hey, this is a required field. Uh, if I try and type user, it's going to tell me that doesn't match. That's not going to work for you. So we go in there and we put in those. We also, for dates, pop up a date time box. In this case, we're not validating that. So if I try to submit, it tells me I can't do that. I've got to specify at least one service. I can specify all of them or any portion. This should be faster. This poor tablet probably can't handle it. Is there any way to implement like a decision tree? Like Take, take an example where I want my help desk to be able to reset services. First, they would probably want to select a machine. Mm -hmm. And then back end, I'd want to query what services they should be able to reset on that machine and then sort of bring you to the next. That, that's, that's definitely something I've, I've considered, but it's not in the scope of what, what I originally wanted to target here. Um, I, I, think, I think there's some possibilities uh, of, of ways to handle that in the future. Um, and in fact, boy, it is just running slow. Question on the follow up on that. Uh, yeah. Parameter sets, if you have an advanced function. No. Does not handle parameter sets. Uh, that, that is, I, it would, you would have to know which parameter sets you're wanting. Um, you, you would probably get very inconsistent. I think the idea, what, what I was targeting with this was to present a quick and easy way to deliver self-service. Yeah. Uh, to, to deliver self-service to the user or to your help desk or whatever group might be appropriate with 
a custom script. This is not necessarily something you would just expose get mailbox or, or you know, it complicate, you know, very advanced scripts. But, but the, the kind of the simpler, quick and easy problems that you need to address. Uh, I, I think we can address, I think we can kind of handle what you're suggesting with decision trees. Um, but coming back, you know, what, what we've also done is if you've collected their phone numbers, you can take this a step further and by not giving the help desk the password at all. And now your help desk, even if I know, you know, if I'm, I'm disgruntled Joe and, and I, uh, I happen to know the CEO's employee ID and his birth date, I'll go and reset the password and I'll go see what's in there. He doesn't have that option because he's not going to get the password at all. The CEO is going to get a text that says, somebody reset my password, what's going on? So, so you can take this as far as you want. Uh, we're going to step outside the idea of, of just a straight password reset, just, just kind of demo some of the other features. Okay. Uh, we also support description. You'll see that in just a second. We also support default values. Um, these are not handled the way PowerShell handles a default value. So if you put a default value here, it's going to populate the field in the form. Uh, that's, so the result is PowerShell sees that as a, as a passed parameter. Uh, that's, it, it, I kind of saw it as, as a, a fair compromise just be aware of that. You know, what, what I've done in my organization is, is the scripts I write internally for our admins might take default values, but when I present these in WebGIA, I usually write a wrapper script that is specific to WebGIA, that, that presents it just the way I want for the target, for the targeted user. So we define more default values. You can define a default value for anything. Uh, we also support most of the validate options. We don't support validate, not null, empty, any of those combinations. If you don't want it, then don't make it required. You can, you can do ranges here. And then you can do you know, long strings as well as Booleans. We're not doing anything special in this, in this script. Uh, so we're going to cross our fingers that third time's a charm. It worked. All right. So if I come down here and I just try to submit, it's going to give me, hey, you, you got to specify one something here. But if I try to go too much, it's going to, it validates. You know, obviously this is going to stop me if I try and go too big. Maybe you were trying to do a, you know, a vendor, a vendor account form or something like that, and you just say, hey, it only needs to be 30 days. That's how long he's going to be here. That is now long enough. And you just have to remember, this is running PowerShell in the back end. So... This, can, th this is going to take as long as your PowerShell script runs. Um, so, you know, if your default app pool runs for 90 seconds, if you have scripts longer than that, you're going to need to increase your app pool timeout. I'll give that just a second. Are there any questions while I'm waiting? Yeah? In this, in this example, what we've given is, is just account operator. So for, for all the demos, it, you can be as precise or as broad as you want. Um, naturally, pr you know, precise is going to be desirable just for security. Uh, but, but in the cases where you can't be precise, if you're dealing with Azure or something like that, you, your results, you, you're at least dealing with a single account 
that in the case of an MSA can only exist on that computer and can't be ported to some other computer and used. So, as you can see, you know, we validate everything. What, what's happening in the script isn't particularly important anymore. I'm just gonna keep going and we're gonna demonstrate some of the other features. Security is set per script, so I can define a group of users or multiple groups yeah. on each individual script. So what, what we can do now is run an onload script. So when we pull up the next web page, it's gonna run this PowerShell and pull some data from AD, and we're just pulling four random users. And we can do some markdown to generate links. I did not show you, did not show you synopsis and description. So what I did was if, if you have an additional description, and if you have synopsis and description, we push description into more. So you can expand it, you can include full HTML in the description. Um, that includes JavaScript, uh, that, that's intentional. Um, if, if you're making changes to the scripts on the box, then you obviously have privileged access. You know, this is something you're gonna wanna vet. If you, if you choose not to provide the synopsis, then description gets pushed up to the top. We'll see that here in a second. Uh, nothing special about those. I've introduced directives in this. Um, you know, in the case of dates, I think most commonly people are just looking for a date, but it's a date time field. And so with just, just specifying this directive in there, we're gonna see in a minute that you get a full date and time selection. The same goes for text. You know, I can, a single line of text might be very difficult to work with if, if you're wanting a, a justification or, or something like that. And so we, we support a multi-line. And you see here, we've done two new things here. We've specified an onload script and we've specified that we're not gonna log parameters on this script specifically. So you've got a global variable that, or a global option that says I wanna log all parameters or not, and then a, a specific on a per script you can choose otherwise. Uh, if, you're, if you're passing in sensitive data, you're gonna to wanna to just consider that uh, on a script by script basis. So what's happening now is it's running PowerShell to collect some users and we're gonna see uh, when it comes up a PowerShell, uh, an additional window with the results. That can be write hosts if you just wanna display a bunch of information or you know, pulling from a database. Uh, I, I'm, I've gotta say I'm a little disappointed with the performance here. It, it was even on this, tablet, it was much faster at home. Um, but we've not had any performance or concerns about this in production. Uh, I think this is just a limitation of this particular box. Yeah? What logging? Is it to disk or the... It, it is logging to disk. Uh, you specify that in the configuration file. If I've got some time, I'll, I'll load it up. Uh, I, I do have a demo to show you the contents. Yeah? Yes, we'll see that shortly. So, you can see here, you can select any of these and you can now click on it. If you look at the bottom, you've got username. 
I'm not going to click that since apparently this is really slow. But you can, and it'll. what ends up happening is it does run, run that on load script again and fill the fields. Uh, there, there's certainly some options to improve here, but you now have a multi-line multi reason. And, and you can fill out a date and time in this, and whatever you choose. And to just approve here, we're going to log in as another user. This user is not part of the group three that we were using earlier. And you can see now that the other options are not being presented. All right. So we're going to shoot through that. There's nothing exciting in that. But we're going to show you shortened versions of the stuff you're looking for. Here you can pass both the username and the host name of who, the machine they're connecting from. These are pulled from ASP.NET, so whatever's in your request, you know, server request variables. Uh, what happens is when the parser runs and sees these, it will process them, but it will not display them. And so we have one field, but when we submit, we're going to see username and host name show up as variables in the, in the PS bound parameters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The certificate is not strictly required. It's just a matter that, honestly, use certificates on everything. You're potentially passing sensitive data on this website. It's just for the website. It's just, for the, website. It's just the, the SSL certificate. Okay. While that's running, I'll show you another option. You don't have to specify any parameters. And what you, want, what you get presented is That was just too much for it. It really was. Apparently, it can only handle one request. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, the limitation. This is not a limitation of IIS. <laughs> Don't run it on your own workstation. Is would would be a solid recommendation. Any other questions while we're waiting? Yes. Yes, everything is passed by uh, parameterized. Everything is passed parameterized, and the results are encoded and, and sanitized. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, that does not apply for your, your description and synopsis, but the script contents and the script output is sanitized. Yes, yes, it, it uses .NET's validation. If, if I go and try and put, I will not try and demo this with my six minutes remaining. But, you know, as you can see, we, we are now passing username. And there, there's nothing special here. Uh, if I were to run this, this runs jobs. You can call jobs. We're, we're connecting to 0365. We're doing basically anything you can do in PowerShell. Yeah? Can you change the display to the submit button? On the submit button? I'm just thinking in that use case. In this might, case? Might get confused. <laughs> I would not recommend this, but there is no reason you couldn't put JavaScript in your description. I don't, don't. I would not recommend that, but there's no reason you can't. 
Um, what I do, what, what, what I've done in my organization is create a landing page. This is, basically it's just a synopsis. But what we've done is we put it in the configuration. So you don't actually have to have a file that backs this. Uh, this is really good for landing pages. It could be, it could be useful in other scenarios, but that's, that's what we most, most use it for. Any questions while we're waiting? Lots of opportunities for questions here. Yeah. Okay, so how do I get started with this? I can just Google it and I can get like a quick, uh, like, quick and dirty, like this is what we need to do, guys. While we're waiting, we'll, we'll jump through these real quick since we're almost out of time. WebGIA lets you live GIA. This is not PowerShell GIA. This is not constrained endpoints, though there's no reason you couldn't use constrained endpoints with this. That, that would certainly, anything you can do to make your environment more secure, do it. Uh, but, but this is, GIA is all about reducing your permissions, logging, monitoring, seeing what your, what your staff are doing. We can do that here. As I mentioned earlier, it's a 2016 box. It's core. CPU and RAM are really just gonna depend on your environment. Um, obviously, one core on one gig on a mobile processor, maybe not, not enough. But, but an environment that, that uh, you, know, you can give sufficient resources we're running this, I think, on two cores and four gigs, and it's very, very responsive. Uh, you don't technically need a certificate. You don't technically need to be domain joined, but authentication is integrated auth, so you'd be limited to local users. As, as somebody asked, all the, all the inputs are parameterized, all the outputs encoded, but your security is your script, uh, as much or as little as you want. I would like to move to async execution, uh, just to make it more responsive. Uh, for, for a proof of concept, and it's very usable this way, uh, I took the, 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 the easier path and, and just said, you know what, we'll execute and wait for the response. Um, I would be interested in hearing y'all's thoughts on stuff like REST. Um, I don't know if this is really something that, that you would wanna automate into, but this, is def this definitely has options, you know, by taking both get and post parameters, you can integrate this with your help desk software or, or some other application that can pass data into this. That, that's a, a, a very useful case. We're doing that. Uh, you don't have to just say, well, go to that web page and enter in all the data. We would pass that data commonly. Finally, you can go to webgia.com. It's all on GitHub. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, email, link. I'm going to head to 403 after this. So if you have questions, come find me. I'll let everybody have a chance to take a picture. And I'll put this up, but since we've got just a minute, there's your, there's also a demo of what every, what it can do in PowerShell. You can mark down images. You can nest both images and links. You can do CS, straight CSS. Uh, I'll warn you, there's an implicit out string at the end. So if you're, you know, anybody who's, tried to output, you know, a get process out file, you end up with system object array. Yeah? Can you touch on what, what do you have for like the logging? Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. When someone does make the change, does it record obviously in the background who made the change and timestamp? It does. Uh, we're gonna, we can do that really quick. And all I'm gonna do is just show you this. It is also possible we also, oh, it doesn't show you that. In another column, it shows you how long the script runs, so you can actually metric how much you've done. 
I'll be in 403 if you want to see more. I appreciate it. Thank you.